What do you think of when you hear the word risk? Does it frighten you? Do you think of what you can lose? Do you think of danger? Do you think of excitement? Well, whatever risk means to you, the chances are that you've never really thought about risking in an organized way. I want to welcome you to the world of risking. Because if you think about it, everything worth having in this world depends on taking a risk. The person you want to love, well, it depends upon risking rejection to get their interest. Maybe to ask them out. Maybe to talk to them even. So many of us sit and wait for opportunities to happen. But the truth is, all opportunities are nothing more than a risk taken. Because the opportunity is there all the time. What I want to show you on this series of tapes is the capacity that you already have to take risks. To help you develop that as a skill. So that you can go into the world and carve your path and get your direction and get your goal and find happiness on your own terms. That's the key. Happiness on your terms. You cannot live someone else's life and you cannot have someone else's goal. Not that they're not enviable someone else's goal, but the fact is what it will require for you to find a goal is your own belief in that goal. And if you are following a goal that is not your, your wish, it's not in your heart, then where are you going to find the energy for it? So the very first thing we're going to talk about in the seminar is helping you understand what it is that you want. But you know, everything requires a risk. Everything. If you just think about crossing the street, it requires a risk. If you think about getting on an elevator, it requires a risk. If you think about moving to a new location, or taking a new job, or even having a success, it requires a risk. A lot of us don't understand what we lose in each risk because the truth is that every risk involves a loss. That's what makes it a risk, because risks are not steps. They are not, they are not something that you can take one step to the next. A risk is a jump. That's what makes it scary, because in that jump, you lose control. You only have your momentum to carry you. And you cannot change direction once you're in the midair, because when you're in midair, there's nothing to hold on to. Most of us approach risks without understanding what it is we're looking for. If you think of a risk as jumping over a chasm, most of us would be terrified looking into the chasm saying, my goodness, I could get killed. But imagine if you didn't look in the chasm and didn't think about that, and you ran to the chasm, and just at the moment you were about to leap, you looked down and you said, wow, that's scary. You would lose your momentum, you would have a, a twinge of fear, and the chances are that you would be unable to do the risk. What I want you to understand more than anything else is that you jump the width of the risk, not the depth. But it is the depth of the risk, the potential terror, that will slow you down emotionally and take away all your steam. That's what this is about. You see, each of us is, an, is a unique blend of our strengths and our weakness. Your strength is what you hope is going to take you to your success. If you have a talent, that's your strength. Uh, but the chances are that you don't realize that with every talent, with every innate capacity to do something strong, there's also an equal and opposite capacity to undermine you. For example, my strength is honesty. People say, well, David, you can cut through to the heart of the problem. That's my strength. My weakness is dishonesty. It's not that I'm dishonest. It's that... Whenever I try to be too verbal or to BS someone, I lose myself. Now, there is no one who is more aware of my capacity to be dishonest than myself. That's what I'm ever vigilant about. Am I telling the truth? Is this really what I want to say? Am I faking it? Am I clear? I must always be watching out for my dishonesty. That's what makes me honest. An honest person is aware of his dishonesty. A dishonest person is not. A strong person is aware of their weakness. A weak person is not. Now, what this means is that you have to understand what your strengths are and what they depend upon, what makes your strengths stronger, what enables you, what empowers you. I'm going to show you all that. I'm going to show you the forces that make you your best. But I'm also going to be diligent in pointing out to you what takes away from that strength? Now, no one wants to admit that they have weaknesses. Uh, we, we hate it. I mean, we hate it when people point them out to us. That's when we're bad students. Uh, that's when we're hard for our partners to approach. And if you think about the time you have with a person you love when they come up to you and there's something wrong, 
Do you know what's wrong? Your weakness is showing. It's always the same thing. If you go through life accepting the fact that you have a weakness, and you see the opportunities to discuss that weakness, not as a criticism or a put down, but as a chance to grow again, then you have the right attitude. No one says you have to be perfect. That's a childish attitude to think that you have to be perfect or get it right the first time. All you want to do is get the direction right and make sure the direction is yours. The direction is one that takes you to a place where you feel like you, you feel like your best. I want to show you that direction. I think you already know it. The first thing you have to understand is that direction is probably where you love things the most. Does that sound strange to you, where you love things the most? You see, you're supposed to be doing what you love in life. If you're not doing what you love in life, then you're not leading with your passion. You're not leading with your focus. You're not leading with your, your natural way of responding to the world. If you're not leading with the thing you love, how do you expect to pay attention to the details that will take you to success? And in other words, I guess another way of saying this is, if you really want success, you have to be a little bit self-indulgent. You have to do what pleases you. That's not what you've been told by a lot of people. Perhaps your parents told you, you have to carry the family banner to success and be with the law firm or be with what we want you to be. But the truth is, you can only be so good carrying someone else's flag. You can only be your best when you're risking for your success. And the success you're risking for is to be the best that you can be. That's a phrase you've probably heard a lot of times. But what I mean by that is the best you can be is a person who's doing what he or she loves. That's what I want for you. A life where you are risking all the time to be better as you, on your terms, for your happiness. It doesn't make a difference what anyone else says your happiness should be. It's what makes you happy. You need to know that we're all made up of, of, of a different blend of personality types. Each of us contains elements of the stages of development that we went through as a child. There's a little bit of the dependent in each of us. You know, the person who wants other people to like them, the person who needs support, the person who is very interested in feelings and human interaction, the person who sometimes gets needy when they're alone. Well, we're all like that under certain circumstances, and certainly we're all like that when we lose someone important to us or, or someone breaks up with us or, or we are separated from people we care about. Our fear that represents the dependent part of us is the sense of rejection that we fear. Then there's a part of the controlling aspect of our lives, and that controlling aspect can rule us as well. Uh, we may, may not think of these as controlling traits, but the need to be perfect, to be right, to be the smartest person, to be the person in control, those are controlling aspects. You know, I mean, when someone finishes your sentence and doesn't let you get the point out because they want it to be the, the way they want it to be so they can argue with you, Controlling people manipulate you. They put words in your mouth. They finish sentences. They tell you what's right for you. They tell you what's wrong for you. But they don't want to hear from you because controlling people don't want to know that you have the ability to make decisions on your own. They want you to need them. Then there's the competitive aspect of our lives. And the competitive aspect is the success-failure part of ourselves. And success-failure people, competitive people, are always taking risks. The problem with competitive people is that they're so risk-conscious, and they think of themselves as such terrific riskers, but they're often taking the wrong risks. They beat the wrong people. It's like running a race with people who are, are two or three years younger than you when you're in the sixth grade. Of course you can beat them. No contest. They just want to win. Winning when there's no real contest is not a victory. Winning when you're not risking to live your best life is also no contest. That's why this is so difficult to understand, and that's why I want to make it clear to you. Some people risk all the time. The compulsive gamblers, the people who are always falling in and out of love, the people who become addicted to certain kinds of behavior. They want the excitement of life. But the excitement of life comes from having the right life from having the right direction, and from finding every day a reassurance, I'm doing the right thing, I'm taking the right chances, I'm risking for me. People who are impatient, who want the excitement more than anything else, are always lost because they're just looking for the next victory. 
and it doesn't mean to them to be successful at something that's in their life. They just want to be successful at something and beat you. People who want to beat you are not people who are fulfilling their life. Real riskers aren't out to beat you. Real riskers are out to become themselves. That's what I want for you. Just as there are three aspects of your personality, the dependent, the controlling, and the competitive, so too are there three basic kinds of risks. The first kind of risks are risks of love, of emotion. Let me get that clear so you understand. We're going to discuss this in great detail. But an emotional risk is telling someone that you're angry with them. Yeah, see, right then, as you heard that, didn't you feel someone in your life that you'd like to go up to and say, you know, you hurt my feelings when you said such and such to me, but you can't do it. You can't do it. Why? Because it's a risk. Why is it a risk? Because they may not like what you said. And if they don't like what you said, I guess that means they don't like you. And if they don't like you, that means they're rejecting you. You're not lovable. You shouldn't have done that. But what's the pressure on you? You see, if you don't take emotional risks and tell people when you feel hurt, what happens to the hurt? It lives within you, it turns into anger, the anger turns against you into guilt, and then you think you're a bad person for being so angry. That's the price you pay for not taking emotional risks. You lower your self-esteem. With a lowered self-esteem, you don't feel you deserve to succeed. You don't feel you deserve to be in charge. You don't feel you deserve love or you deserve any of the good things in life. That's why emotional risks are at the heart of all risking, because they are the risks you need to take to maintain your self-esteem. Risks of control. Well, we know a lot of people who are able to take risks of control. You're going to buy 100 shares of American Talent Dell. That's a risk of control. You're risking your money. You're saying, I believe this money is going to get me the most strength and power back if I put it here. I am going to risk assets. Risks of power and control are risks of asset. They're risks of influence. They're risks of power. Yes, power. What do I mean by that? Well, for instance, if you reprimand a child and don't follow through, you're risking power. Because when you don't follow through, the child looks at you and says, hmm, that's an empty threat. But it's even a worse threat to follow through on a bad reprimand just because you have to show power. Because then the child says, this is an unreasonable person, and therefore none of the things this person demands of me are worth listening to. So risks of control have a very strong propensity for going out of control. You know people who said, I'll show them, and then they throw their assets behind something totally stupid. A lot of the risks of war, by the way, are risks of power like that. No one's going to insult our flag, and so terrible things happen. You see, a person who is a controlling person also has to have good self-esteem, or else they run the risk of squandering their assets to protect that self-esteem. If someone calls you a jerk, you don't need to turn around and, and say something to them. You can also ignore them and not let it hurt you. You can be bigger than that. But if you have to defend yourself at every fool's criticism of your behavior, then you'll be distracted from your goal. Remember, your goal is to live your best life as you not to be distracted by people who are going to put you down. People are always going to be putting you down when you take a risk because your risk is going to frighten other people. You may not know that, but your risk makes other people say, ooh, look at that person taking a risk. I should be doing that. So they're going to put you down in order to feel better about themselves. So if you need other people's approval to risk, you're in trouble. We'll talk about where you get the strength from risking in this program as well. Finally, the, the competitive risks are risks in which you run the risk of failing. Failing. What is failing? The, well, the point you have to understand, now this is going to sound odd, but you don't learn from your successes. Your success is a reward. Sometimes it's luck, but your success should be a reward. You only learn from your failures because it is your failures that give you a perspective of, of your weakness. Your perspective of your weakness tells you what you should be paying attention to. 
if you have a life where you got all A's in school, never made a mistake, never missed a touchdown pass, never did anything wrong, you wouldn't be a human being. We most admire those people in our society who have failed and fought their way back. The comeback, right? That gives us great heart. The hard luck story at the Olympics, where, where someone hasn't won for years, and finally, on the last race of his career, Jensen wins the thousand. The victory is that finally there is triumph in overcoming. What do you overcome? You overcome weakness. And when you overcome weakness, you grow the most. That's why I mentioned before that you cannot neglect your weakness. You must be aware of it. You must embrace it. And you must consider your weakness part of your character. It will never go away. You never outgrow your weakness, but you are able to overcome it by being aware of where you can slip and don't step on those slippery places. So the competitive risks are the risks of success. And the worst risk you can take is for a success that has nothing to do with you whatsoever. If you become a success merely to avoid a failure at something you really like, what was the point of your life? If you didn't fail the failures you were supposed to fail to learn the lesson to become your best, then you lived a life that didn't have anything to do with you. You're supposed to risk your risks, fail your failures, and grow your growth. No one can do it for you. No one wants to do it for you. Anyone who says they're going to do it for you is only trying to control you. There are no easy victories. The payoff, you see, is not in money, although it can be a fortune. The payoff is in peace of mind, knowing that what you had to do, you did, and what you will have to do, you will do, and that you're ready to do it. You have to be ready to risk through life, for risk is an ongoing process. Now, we've taken a look at the three kinds of people and the three kinds of risks, but the critical thing is the thing that holds people back, and that's the three kinds of losses. In the dependent risks, the risks of emotion, the person is risking all the time rejection. In a word, it's the loss of love. You're no good, boo hiss, you're unlovable, right? Isn't that what you fear when you take a risk of love? We fear rejection. We fear learning that we're not good. In risks of control, we fear the loss of power. We fear that we are going to be made weak, that our vulnerability will show. And once our vulnerability shows, everyone will know that we are a paper tiger and we have nothing to enforce our rules, and therefore everyone will be free to do whatever they want. Because a person who is risking a risk of control thinks that if they lose their power, no one will be with them. It's like the angry old rich man in the movies who loses all of his money, now no one pays him any respect. And that's the hidden dread of every person who is afraid of taking a risk of power. The risk of failure is the loss that risks of the competitive type are trying to avoid. But if you spend all your life trying to avoid failure, you never really get a success because success depends upon em embracing the possibility of failure and looking at the possible downside so that you can prepare for it. If everything is going to be terrific and all risks could be planned out, then success wouldn't be success. It would be commonplace. But success is not commonplace. It's plan. Risking. It scares you, but it invigorates you. Risking, it makes you wonder whether or not you're living the right life. But if you take the right risks, your life feels full. It feels alive. Your day feels as if it's meaningful. You're not drifting. You don't wonder, what should I be doing? Although every person who's taking risks is always wondering, what should I be doing next? Is this the right thing or is this the right thing? But the person who's taking the right risks is not asking the question, am I the right me? They know they're the right them. I want to help you risk for being the right you. That's the best gift I can give. And you know what? It's the thing that's going to make the most difference in your life.